record to this computer. So I think we're started. Very cool. Welcome everybody to the study club, to the ZK study club. Um, for this edition or this episode, we're going to have Pratush Mishra and Nick Spooner. Uh, sadly, Benedict wasn't able to make it. He was supposed to be on this as well. But they're going to be discussing their recent work on accumulation schemes and how these can be used to construct more efficient recursive SNARKs. Um, but before we kick off, I want to very quickly remind everyone in the group that the ZK Summit is coming up. And if you're thinking of speaking or if you just want to give us some feedback, I'm going to add the link to the uh, form in the chat and I'll also add it to anyone watching after in the show notes uh, of the YouTube video. So please do submit your talk soon because we're going to be doing the programming in the next like couple days. Um, yeah. So Nick is going to start off. Nick, feel free to take it away. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I'm going to be talking about uh, a paper that I, I wrote with uh, Benedict, uh, Alessandro, and, and Pratish. Um, I am actually now a postdoc at uh, BU, so this is a, a bit uh, out of date, but um, uh, the title of the paper is Proof Carrying Data from Accumulation Schemes, uh, but you may be more familiar with sort of the related notion of recursive composition of, of SNARKs. Um, and this is actually what this talk is about. This is just sort of the, the more like uh, proper title. Um, so the motivation, at least sort of uh, from a very uh, from a sort of more more academic cryptographic perspective, you're delegating a non-deterministic computation. Um, so so whenever I say non-deterministic computation, you can always just like think of a blockchain uh, if that if that helps. Um, but basically, you have like a, a long-running computation. Uh, where you have sort of inputs and, and witnesses. Um, and uh, there, is, uh, there is sort of uh, kind of two options that you have in, in delegating this computation. So in, like you're, you're going to ask someone to do it for you. You want them to prove that they did it correctly. Um, so the first one is this sort of monolithic proof. So you, you get your favorite snark or whatever, and you uh, you write down the computation, you write down like the entire transcript, and then you prove that the, the computation was, was done correctly, right? Um, so, uh, oh, I should mention, sorry, that, that when, I, when I'm talking about like a, like a long-term computation, I mean that kind of you uh, have a sequence of, of steps. Um, should I be looking in the, in the chat? Okay, no, uh, You have a, a sequence of steps that are all the same, that like there's like a single sort of uh, uh, step function that takes you from one step, step one computation state to another. This is f, and you apply the function f t times uh, to itself. Um, so one way you can do this is you can just write down this entire transcript, and you can prove this is sort of like Starks and things like this. You can prove that uh, this computation was done correctly. Um, this works, but it has a couple of uh, caveats. So firstly. Uh, you require sort of a large amount of prover memory. Uh, so this is uh, like the prover, the, generally the memory requirement for the prover in this uh, system is going to be like this, the state width times the time, right? So this is the, the this is the space, the space need to compute F times the time, right? Because you have to write down this entire computation table. Um, this uh, even if kind of the yeah you know, so so this can be much much bigger than than at the, the space required to uh, compute the computation which is just s. Um, the other thing is that if you have a proof of t steps and you want to prove like the next step you want to prove t plus one steps then you have to do the entire thing again. Um, so in some situations this is uh, this is very undesirable, um, and so the alternative which is. Uh, uh, originally proposed by Valiant in 2008, is this thing called incrementally verifiable computation. And what it says basically is that rather than uh, re rather than computing everything and uh, proving everything in one go, what you do is you prove an application of f at a, one application of f at a time. So you know I take in the first input and the first uh, witness, and I run like I turn the the crank and I, I get out like a, uh, the first output and the first proof. Um, and then I plug this into like another instance of my prover, and I do this over and over again. Um, and uh, in the end, I uh, I end up 
So I, I do this over and over again. And in the end, I end up with the with the output, which is this uh, zt and the proof pi t, which can attest to the, the correctness of the entire computation. Um, so this is the kind of thing that is used, uh, like this is the kind of setting for succinct blockchains, right? Because you can think about uh, this, this uh, pf, this, this f as being the, the transition function for the blockchain. Um, and this is very useful in this in the setting because uh, the blockchain is kind of a, a uh, like an evolving computation, right? So it's not like you have, you run T steps and then you're done. Uh, you're gonna like continuously run this computation. You're interested in its correctness at every time step. Um, so are there any questions about the, the motivation and how this relates to using blockchains? Um, yeah, just in general, I mean, given the, the way, just for every, all the participants, if anyone has questions or ideas, I know Nick, you're gonna kind of stop along the way. So you can add yeah. some of the questions into the chat if you just wanna like remember them, we'll, we'll revisit that. Um, otherwise, yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's, just, it's difficult for me to look at the chat and do the thing. So if, uh, if you I, ideally just stop me and I'll... <laughs> no problem. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, okay, great. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, just sort of quickly about, about applications of this thing. So one of them obviously is in blockchains. Uh, this is sort of why we're talking about it in this, in this uh, CK study club, but uh, you can also use them to build more efficient snarks in some sense. So you, the, this is the sort of the original, uh, like it's so called bootstrapping for, for snarks. Um, this is not really something that is done because it doesn't actually lead to practically efficient things, but at least for, uh, uh, for I think probably you get, you get sort of maximally efficient snaps. Um, you can also use them to do, use this to do verifiable delay functions because you, you, uh, if you think about this F as being like a, a so something that like takes a little bit, a little while to compute, um, then you apply it many, many times, um, then you can prove this. Uh, that you've applied this thing many, many times uh, in a way that you can verify much more efficiently. Um, there's also like not some app use things like this. Um, so th this is a you know this is a great primitive. Um, and the question is how do we actually build this thing? Um, and the original construction, uh, which is from the BCC T13 paper, uh, says that basically snarks with Polylogarithmic verification imply IBC and PCD, and we'll see like how that works in a sec. Um, and uh, oh, sorry, I should say PCD is IBC, but uh, rather than just a just a like a uh, a line like a path of computation, you can have like an arbitrary uh, directed acyclic graph, so like a tree or some some more complicated graph. Um, so this sort of models rather than like just a linear computation, more like a distributed computation. Um, but you, every time I say IBC PCD, you can just think about IBC if you want. Um, and, uh, okay. So, so this was extended more recently to, uh, to building this thing out of snarks with sublinear verification. So this is like not polylog, but like anything that's like below linear. Um, and also we showed that, uh, we showed in this, this paper that, uh, if the snark you start with is post-quantum, then so is the resulting scheme, uh, in case you're interested in that. Um, unfortunately, this sublinear verification requirement is like pretty strong. Um, so it restricts the like snarks that you can use. And particularly, you might want to use snarks that have desirable properties, but have like linear verification time. Um, and so the question that we ask in this paper is like, is sublinear verification required for IBC PCD? And uh, there is some, some evidence to suggest that that's, that's not the case. So there's this HALO work, um, this is Bo, Grig, and Hopwood. Uh, and what they do is they show that uh, they, they like propose a way that you could do recursive composition for like a specific snark, which is the, the sub, like bulletproofs type uh, snark, which has linear verification. Um, but you can like do some special trick that, that uh, allows you to nonetheless recursively compose it to sort of get around this sublinear verification requirement. Um, and so they do a, a bunch of, uh, they, they do a bunch of uh, work in sort of the practical aspects of this, like how you would implement this. 
Um, but they, what they don't do is they don't describe in detail the, the way that you would construct IVC uh, and they don't prove it secure. Um, so we sort of plug this, plug this gap in this, uh, in this paper. Um, Nick, I have a quick question. Um, yes. The S in SNOC stands for succinct, right? So what is a SNOC with linear verification? So, okay, so succinct can mean two different things. Uh, so I'm looking at the very broad definition of SNARKs where succinct means that the proof is small. Uh, whereas the, the verification okay. may, be, may be linear. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there, are, there is a, some people when you, when, when you say SNARK, it, it means like uh, also the verification is, is short, but in this case, I'm gonna be more permissive. Um, okay. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, so we introduce this new notion, this a cryptographic notion called accumulation schemes. Uh, and we show that if you have a SNOC in the accumulation scheme, then you can get uh, this IVC PCD, even if the SNOC does not actually have sublinear verification. So even if it, you know, it, it's linear or worse. Uh, secondly, uh, we can obtain SNOCs with accumulation schemes uh, by basically combining a SNOC with where you, the verification is efficient relative to some primitive when the accumulation scheme for that primitive and Pratush will talk more about this it might not be very clear what that means at the moment um, and finally we show that you know you can instantiate this in the case of polynomial commitment schemes um, so there is sort of one uh, big caveat here uh, which is important from a cryptographic perspective um, which is that theorem one holds in the standard model. So this is where there is no random oracle. Um, and it doesn't hold in the random oracle model. Whereas theorem three, we don't know how uh, to instantiate in the standard model. Uh, theorem two actually is black box, so it holds in both. Um, and so you have to move from one model to the other in order to sort of stick all this stuff together and get the, the, the final scheme that you want. Um, so this is something that you know we believe to be fine from a security perspective, but it's unsatisfying uh, as a cryptographer. Um, uh, finally, you may have heard of things called set accumulators. Uh, these are different. They're, this has nothing to do with set accumulators whatsoever. Do not think about set accumulators. Um, okay. Uh, so here's like a more more pictographic presentation of the results. Uh, so what you want is uh, you know in the end you want this PCD. Um, and uh, the way that you build it by, by theorem one is uh, using by using a snark with an accumulation scheme. And the way that you can get this is you apply theorem two to a snark, which is uh, efficient sort of relative to some predicate um, and an accumulation scheme for that predicate, uh, sorry, a, a snark, which is, uh, uh, you, yeah, which is efficient relative to some predicate and accumulation scheme for that predicate. Um, and, uh, you know, as an aside, you also get succinct verified snarks. This is sort of what you would like to do in, in principle, uh, except that we don't know how to build these accumulation schemes uh, uh, in the standard model. So actually you sort of have to start with some accumulation scheme uh, in the random oracle model and this, a snark, which in this case is also in the random oracle model. Um, then you apply theorem two to obtain a snark with an accumulation scheme. This is again in the random oracle model. And then you apply some some heuristics. So this is like the, the step that is like not necessarily cryptographically justified. Uh, this gives you a, a snark with an accumulation scheme, which you can then uh, apply theorem one to to obtain new constructions of PCD and IVC with uh, with new properties. Uh, okay, are there are more questions. I have a quick question on this one. So yeah. if you start with a snark in in the in the ROM. Um, and you do something very simple, just a single layer of recursion, nothing fancy like IVC or whatnot. Do you do you, do we still have these kind of problems even with just one layer of recursion? Uh, I guess it depends on what you want to get out of it. Um, so I think you can. So 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 the the problem is right. The that I at some point I'm going to have to start proving things about the oracle. Uh, so whenever I have to prove anything about the oracle, I have to break the abstraction and in instantiate the, the oracle with a, with a hash function. If I can get around this, like with one, one level of recursion, you might be able to say, well, I don't need to prove anything about the oracle. I could just sort of save all my oracle queries for later and then, and then do them at the end. 
so it's possible that you could get something um, meaningful in actually in the random oracle model. Um, but you can't do this like like big depth recursion. Um, this, uh, yeah. One layer of recursion you can just um, basically, as, as Nick said, you can just sort of save the queries and evaluate the random oracle outside uh, the recursion and just feed in the results as sort of public input into the recursive snark. And then inside the snark, you only you assume that the random oracle queries are answered honestly. And then outside the snark, the verifier actually runs a random oracle on the queries. Yeah, that seems like that should work. Um, okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to quickly now go through sort of the, a bit of the history of this. So I, I don't know if you, if uh, people have seen uh, the construction of recursive composition from SNARKs before, um, but I will uh, sort of go through it very quickly. Um, so firstly, this is sort of the, the blueprint for IBC, right? So you have these two algorithms. There is a prover algorithm and a verify algorithm. The prover takes in uh, like a, a, an input, um, which is the current state of the computation Z, uh, and along with a witness for this step. Uh, and a proof pi, and then outputs uh, the next stage of the computation Z prime along with the, the proof pi prime. And then the verifier, uh, he, at, at any point, he can like come in and try and verify the computation. So he like takes the, this uh, Z and pi and, uh, and outputs 0, 1, depending on whether he thinks it's, uh, it's correct or not. Um, and you can see that kind of this allows you to, to do this, uh, comp this sort of stepwise proving because I can just sort of feed the answer of the prover back into itself and, and get a get a new proof. Um, so I won't go through the the definitions. Uh, I think that probably uh, I don't know if there are if there are any questions about this setup like why this is the definition of IVC uh, then go ahead and ask but I'm not going to go into detail on the definitions otherwise. Uh, Um, so one important point. Well, actually, is I do that, have oh, one sorry. one quick question. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I'm interested in the the VDF use case. Okay. And in that use case, you only need soundness. You don't need knowledge soundness. Mm -hmm. So does this simplify anything, or or does it yield you know better results in some way? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, at the moment, we don't. Uh, we don't know of any, like, we don't know that it helps to only target soundness. Um, so in the proof that this is secure, you need to use proof of knowledge and then you kind of obtain proof of knowledge sort of for free. Um, it might be the case that there are, if you're only interested in soundness, there are other ways to do it, but we don't know. Okay, thank um, you. Yeah. Uh, so what was I saying? Oh yeah, so crucially for the efficiency of the scheme, it needs to be the case that the size of the proof never changes, right? So you could, uh, you could imagine like a, a sort of rubbish IVC scheme where the proof grows with T, right? So every time you apply the, the prover, it, like the proof gets a little bit bigger, this would be no good because, because then you would have a, a proof which is like of size T uh, at the end, and this would not be succinct. Um, so we're just gonna enforce uh, that the proof stays the same size. Um, one other thing about this definition, I guess, that, that is uh, important to note uh, is that we don't make any assumptions about where the previous proof comes from. So the previous proof could be adversarially generated, like it doesn't have to come from an honest application of the prover. Uh, and the system should still be, like, should still work even if you throw in proofs that were adversarially generated. Um, so uh, let me quickly define a snark. I guess everyone has probably seen this. So this is a, uh, so we're going to think about snarks with pre-processing. Uh, so there is a setup which uh, takes in the in the circuit and outputs like a pr proving proving a verification keys with the circuit, um, and you know we have a, we have the natural sort of completeness and adaptive proof of knowledge properties, uh, sublinear proofs. So this is like the thing that I'm insisting on is that the size of the proof is much smaller than the size of the circuit. And then I'm gonna say it's optional whether you have to lay a verification or not. Um, okay, so let's see quickly how we build IBC from recursive composition of snarks. Uh, so 
so the, I'm going to describe first the, the, the prover and then the verifier. So uh, the prover, if you remember from the picture, so I, I've dropped this W, but uh, the, just to simplify things. So you have the, just a, a Z and a pi coming in and a, and a Z and a pi coming out, which is sort of the, the, this is the step function of the computation. And uh, we can just sort of fill in what ought to happen in order to go from ZT to ZT plus one and from pi T to pi, pi T plus one. So obviously to go from ZT to ZT plus one, you apply the, the function F, right? This is the step function of the computation. Um, now we have this proof pi T, which we uh, would like to make sure is correct. And so we are going to apply the verifier to it, the snark verifier. Um, this, if we compose these two things together, this is a, this gives us a circuit R, which is the uh, sort of the, the recursive circuit. Um, so this is the thing we're actually going to prove. Um, it also takes in uh, itself, uh, it takes in a description of itself as a, uh, as a verification key. Um, and then in order to generate the new proof, all I have to do is I have to just prove that the recursive circuit would accept. So that, that it would sort of output the, the, this uh, ZT plus one um, that you told me and also that the previous proof would verify. Okay, so that's the, this is like the basic recursive composition prover. Uh, and the recursive composition verifier is really just the snark verifier. Um, so it's going to take in, you know, the initial state and the final state and the, the final proof and uh, just decide whether it accepts or not, but just by running the snark verifier on this. Um, uh, with respect to this, this, uh, so the circuit that it's, that's verifying is this circuit, this recursive circuit R. Um, so I won't do the completeness proof, uh, but basically the uh, the completeness follows from the snark completeness and the soundness, what you do is you do this sort of recursive extraction. This is actually where the proof of knowledge comes in. So you need to sort of go back in time and you need to extract the previous proof and you do this over and over again until you until you get back to, to time one. Um, so are there any questions about, about this? Like, uh, does this make sense just why this works? Quick question, Nick, sorry. Um, yeah. Just to make it clear, the instance here, like the public inputs in some sense, are, are they all of the ZT plus I's or are, is it just, oh, I can see, sorry, Z1 and ZT. Yeah, yeah. So the, okay. the so the Z's have this property that like the you know they're determined by uh, by doing the step. So you only need to know Z one and Z T, and then you can well you only need to know Z one. You can figure out everything in the middle, but you you're interested in Z T. So you, you know, like Z big yeah. T is the last. It's the last step. Yeah, exactly. It's like the output of the computation at time T. Yeah. Thanks. Um, so the nice thing here is that the sufficiency property appears to be satisfied because the size of a snark proof, so the, the size of the proof here is that just the size of a snark proof for the recursive circuit R, which is some fixed circuit. Um, but this is worth diving into a little bit more because it is the actual reason why, why you need some linear verification. Um, so the basic thing is that the, the verifier circuit V needs to be able to check its own circuit. Like it need, you need to be able to feed the description of the verifier circuit into itself. Um, so, okay, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't spend much time on this, but basically the, the, the point is that, uh, I need that the size of the verifier circuit for a circuit of size N star is at most N star minus something. And so this means that the verifier, the, the size of the circuit to verify a circuit of size N star has to be smaller than N star. And this is sort of where the sublinear verification comes in. Um, so what about if you don't have it? Uh, so this is where we introduce this thing called an accumulation scheme. And uh, I have like a, a picture which uh, sort of explains what an accumulation scheme is. And then I'll explain how you get PCD from it. Um, so imagine that you have a sequence of uh, inputs, like a, this, this, uh, like a stream of data coming in, um, Q1 up to QT. And you have a predicate, uh, you have a predicate phi which uh, you apply to each of these QIs. And you're interested in what is the conjunction of the phi's applied to all of the QIs that are coming in, right? So I'm interested in like this, this big and over here. 
Um, so one way that I could do that is I could just evaluate phi of uh, qi for every qi and then take that. Right? So this this uh, this is kind of the the basic way that I can do this. Um, and we want to do do something more efficient uh, with the help of a prover. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to build this thing called an accumulator, which allows us to essentially capture this, this, uh, the truth value of this, this statement uh, with the help of the prover. So what the prover does is he uh, takes in each of these QIs and he, uh, in each step, he, he takes in the accumulator uh, and applies his prover function to the accumulator and the, the QI to get the next accumulator. And so he keeps doing this. Um, and what the verifier does is so that there's a, like this algorithm, the accumulation verifier. And what this does is it checks that the prover did his work correctly. So it, it takes in the, the Q, it takes in the A0, it takes in the A1, uh, and it checks that the prover did this accumulation step correctly. Uh, so you have one of these also at every time step. And then finally, there is an algorithm called the decider, which takes in just the accumulator uh, at, say, at, at some time. Um, and it decides to whether whether the accumulator is valid or not. Um, and if I take the conjunction of all of these things, so all of these verifiers and the decider, and I get one, this implies that, uh, that the and of all of the QIs uh, was, uh, the and of all of the phi QIs was indeed one. Um, so why is this helpful? Well, if, uh, if the verifier, if this little verifier guy, the accumulation verifier is relatively efficient uh, compared to evaluating the predicate, then I've saved computation because I only had to do uh, like one big decision at the end and then T little verifications. Um, and I sort of uh, delegated everything else to the prover. Um, Okay, so this is nice, but I, you know, it, it doesn't immediately seem to give you a IVC. Um, oh, sorry. So one thing, the size of the accumulator should also not grow with the the time t, right? So this would be trivial if it if it did, um, but it doesn't. So sorry, here here yeah. the prover is is trying to logically prove phi the predicate. So he's trying to prove uh, like this conjunction the uh, the conjunction of all the all the phi's. Um, Right, so he uh, he's trying to yeah. So in each step, right, he's trying at, to at prove, each step, yeah, right. he's trying so to prove uh, that that all of the previous uh, phi's were satisfied, and also the new one, uh, you know, is also is also satisfied by this QI. Okay. Yeah. So um, instead of, I mean, what what would be really the difference between that and just the prover proving phi on every QI, and then the verifier just verifying every proof? Uh, so this would be like the, so th this would be like more work for the, for the verifier, I think. Um, because so you want to say that. Yeah. Uh, what are the mini verifiers doing here then? Like, so the mini verifiers are, are just checking the accumulation step, I guess. Let's see. So the, so you're saying maybe I just, I prove that phi is satisfied. Like all the, what the verifier does is just, is just, uh, is just check a proof that phi is, is satisfied. Right. Um, like if I'm if I'm delegating the work to the prover anyway. Yeah. And I use a succinct uh, proving system, might as or. Right. Right. So okay, the point but, is that ah, we're is talking a, about that it's not a, a sublinear verification. Yeah. Exactly. So I don't have a succinct proving system. Yeah. So this, uh, I, I guess I should say this, 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 like one way to build this is to use a snark. This is like a weaker thing than a, a snark. Um, so it, it might be easier to construct. Um, okay, so so I guess the, the interesting thing is, you know, we can attain a snark from this like weaker object. Um, and the theorem says that if I take a snark and I, I uh, have an accumulation scheme for the predicate, which is the snark verified, then I get uh, IVC PCD for, uh, and then I get IVC or PCD. Um, so here the, the verifier doesn't need to be sublinear, but the accumulation verifier has to be. And so it's sort of important here that the accumulation is like an easier task than, uh, accumulation verifying is an easier task than verifying basically. Uh, Cause I want this uh, accumulation verifier to be, to be sublinear. Um, 
then uh, okay, so as 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 I uh, as sort of I alluded to, if if the verifier is already sublinear, then you can sort of use this trivial accumulation scheme where like the decider does nothing and the the verifier is just the snark verifier. Um, and so we also get some some nice security properties. Um, so this the construction basically looks very similar. It's just that you have this extra this extra thing. So uh, the IVC proof now consists of a, a snark proof pie, um, which is still small, but it's not easy to verify. And uh, an IVC proof uh, and an accumulation uh, yeah, an accumulator uh, A, and you you want to apply the this uh, this prover and you you go from uh, like zi pi a to zi plus one pi a plus one a plus one. Um, so again, we can just fill in what sort of logically has to happen. So f takes you from zi to zi plus one. Um, to go from ai to ai plus one, you apply the accumulation scheme prover uh, because the this is an accumulation scheme for the snark verifier and the snark verifier is going to take in uh, zi and pi i um, and then the, the other thing that you need for an accumulation scheme is to take in the previous accumulator, and this gives you the next accumulator. Um, then I'm going to want to check that the prover did its job correctly, so I'm going to feed the necessary things into the accumulation verifier. And finally, uh, I like the thing that I need to do is I need to attest to the fact that I checked this, um, and so this is done by using the uh, Using the snark prover, so this you build this this uh, recursive circuit R, um, and you apply the snark prover, and this gives you the next proof step. Um, now the verifier just consists of the decider algorithm, right? So it needs to check that the accumulator was computed correctly at the end, uh, along with the snark verifier, which is potentially uh, remember is potentially linear time, but this is fine because I only do it like right at the end. Um, so why did we save here? Like, why did we not need the snark verifier to be linear, to be sublinear? Uh, it's because the recursive circuit now doesn't contain the snark verifier. It contains this other thing, the accumulation verifier, which is doing something that is potentially easier. Um, okay, so soundness I will skip because it's uh, it's basically works by this by the same principle. You sort of extract backwards in time, but now you also need to use the uh, the soundness of the accumulation scheme to make sure everything works out. Um, and uh, so that is sort of it for this half of the talk. This is the, the, the theorem that you get. Um, and I will uh, hand over to, to Pratyush who will answer the question of how we construct snarks from accumulation schemes. Uh, and, all right. and maybe okay. while we're doing that, if there are any thoughts, questions, comments. Yeah, feel free to ask. Let's uh, well, look and see if it. there's anything. I. I... Had a question about one of the sl the last slides. I don't know if it's uh, the same presentation or not, but uh, I was just um, thinking of like I, I don't I didn't get this time to see it, but was there any recursive uh, part? Because it seemed like the pi i plus one was sent to the verifier of the snark. Um, yeah. Right. So there is recursion, right? Um, so we do have this in the end, the snark prover, right? Which proves right. some recursive circuit. But the point is, this recursive circuit does not contain the snark verifier. It only contains the accumulation scheme verifier. Um, so you're so really just generating two, two, okay. So like, okay, so like in the previous picture, let me try to go back to wherever that was. Da, 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 da. Okay, yeah, so in this picture, you can see the recursive circuit contains the snark verifier, right? And the problem yeah. is that now like we're trying to construct things with so this snark verifier is like quite large. It's like linear. So it's the size of, you can think of this box as being the same size as R, right? So you can't like keep doing it because R will keep growing as you like go down your time steps, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, blah, blah. oh no. So oh yeah, okay, okay. So what we do is like we sort of kick the snark verifier out of the recursive circuit and we replace it with this accumulation scheme verifier. And now what we say, but now because this snark verifier is no longer inside the circuit, it doesn't have to be sublinear because R, like this recursive circuit, does not, and the size of that does not depend on the snark verifier anymore. Instead, what we require right. is the accumulation scheme verifier must be sublinear. 
you're essentially uh, showing a one one level recursion here though right that's that was my confusion i think yeah so there's a one level recursion you can just imagine that you know you can sort of so copy keep adding provers yeah yeah have more copies of the ivc prover in the middle and in the end like there'll just be one ivc verify that verifies the final like t step proof perfect thanks for that clarification Okay. There, there was one question also in the chat from Srikar, who who asked if there's a concrete example of this accumulation scheme, and I guess I mean Halo uses something like this. But... Yeah. So in this, yeah. So Halo, for example, they they didn't phrase it as such because I mean our paper was not out when they <laughs> released their paper. Um, but yeah. So Halo, like if you view it in the right way, like it is an accumulation. Like the key idea there is to construct an accumulation scheme for one specific snark. And we'll go over like you know how that construction looks. There's also like you can sort of plug in different underlying components with uh, accumulation schemes and get different uh, snarks with uh, uh, different sort of properties, uh, which we'll see uh, in the rest of the talk. Okay. So let me go on. Okay. Any other questions about this part? Like so, as Nick said, basically recursion is just it's very similar to the recursion for uh, uh, sorry the soundness for this is very similar to the soundness for um, so the standard recursive composition, but additionally, you have to rely on soundness of the accumulation scheme, not knowledge extraction, just soundness, which is, I think, a cool thing. Okay. Is there another question in the chat? I don't know. Uh, no, okay. you just said thanks. Okay. All right. Okay. So the question is now, how do we construct these snacks which have accumulation schemes? All right. All right. So our starting point. Uh, we'll basically like the, uh, we'll show how to construct the accumulation schemes for a certain class of snacks. And these are so-called predicate efficient snacks. And okay, let me define what this is. So a snack is said to be predicate efficient with respect to some predicate. If you can take the snack verifier and decompose it into two parts, an expensive part, which corresponds to the predicate and a cheap part, which I'll denote by VPE standing for predicate efficient, right? So diagrammatically, what this looks like is that you can sort of take your snark verifier and split it into the small box, which is VPE, which outputs you know, some decision bit, uh, whether to accept or not. And it also outputs a sort of set of queries, which go into like copies of this predicate file, each of which is ex potentially expensive, right? And the idea is that the snark verifier V as a whole accepts if BPE equals one. So if the, the sufficient, the cheap part accepts, as well as if all of these predicates accept, like these small, like these phi's accept. They're not actually small, they can be expensive, right? <clears throat> and yeah, so this is basically the definition of a predicate efficient snack. The idea is that you can take your verifier and like, chop it up into some very efficient small portion, VPE, and some like more uh, like expensive portion called, uh, which we'll just call generically like a phi, a predicate phi here, right? Okay, so uh, yeah. This is supposed to be cheap to compute, and each of these files is expensive to compute. All right. So what we show is that for this class of snarks, if you have an accumulation scheme for the predicate, right, then you can additionally get an accumulation scheme for the snark as a whole, right? So let's see what this construction looks like. It's very very simple. For the prover, for the accumulation scheme prover for the snark. What you do is um, okay. So you have these three algorithms: um, the prover, verifier, and decider. The prover takes in um, like some proof and instance pair, and along with like a past accumulator and outputs a new accumulator. The verifier takes in this you know proof instance pair along with the old accumulator and checks the new accumulator, and the decider just checks the final accumulator. Okay, so let's see what all of these algorithms look like. So the decider, as the prover, is very simple, right? It computes the predicate efficient portion of the of the snark verifier, right? So it computes this VPE on x comma pi, and gets out. Um, this decision bit and the set of queries, and then it invokes the accumulator accumulation prover for the for this predicate phi, right? So you can see here it invokes p phi, right? And so you get yeah on on this query set that is output by the pe. So essentially, what we're doing is we're sort of accumulating all of the um, uh, queries that that would have been sort of input to phi. We're just accumulating them away into this a prime, right? And okay, so I think in the talk so far, we only mentioned like accumulating one input or like one query at a time. You can actually sort of generalize the definition to accumulate multiple um, inputs and multiple accumulators at a time. Um, 
so that, that's what we do here. So instead of, if, it's, if it makes things simpler, you can just imagine Q as consisting of just one input. Um, right, okay, so this is a very simple, like what, what the prover does. The verifier is also similarly, you know, uh, easy to reduce to uh, V5. So what the snark accumulation verifier does is it computes uh, this verification predicate uh, sorry, this predicate efficient uh, portion of the SNARK verifier on X comma pi, it gets out the bit and the query set. So remember this VPE is cheap, right? So it, the SNARK, uh, this accumulation verifier can always run VPE, okay? Um, it checks that this bit is one and then it invokes the accumulation verifier for the inner predicate and checks that, you know, uh, on that set of, on the query and the old accumulator and the new accumulator, sort of this accumulation happened correctly, right? And the decider is just one step. It just invokes the decider for the, for the predicate. So nothing fancy there. Okay. Any questions on, like, like on the predicate efficient snark definition as well as this construction? So I haven't mentioned like, what the predicate can be. We'll see in a moment just what these predicates can be. Uh, but sort of assuming like, you know, there, is, there, there exists such snark, does this construction make any sense? Are there any questions about it? Did I mention any, Did I explain anything not clearly? Okay, um, if not, then we'll go on. Yeah, basically the idea is that you sort of accumulate away the expensive part of the snark verifier. Instead of computing, it just accumulated away for future people to check in like, some future time. All right, okay. So at high level, the secu um, because the construction is simple, it's like fairly straightforward to reduce security of the accumulation scheme for the snark to, to the accumulation scheme for the predicate. And additionally, we you get some nice properties that if uh, this accumulation scheme is, like the inner accumulation scheme is quantum secure, then so is the outer one. And so similarly for zero knowledge, right? Okay, so sort of the, yeah, and efficiency is, yeah, the efficiency for the inner thing along with the efficient, uh, along with the time taken to run this um, cheap portion of the snark verifier, that VPE, okay? So sort of the takeaway from this part is that, um, uh, like, why did we go through this? Like, you might think, oh, we sort of started off with, you know, a goal to construct an accumulation scheme, and now we're still left with a goal to construct an accumulation scheme. But the idea is that now we sort of reduced our, uh, like, the work that we have to do. The idea being that sort of phi should be like a simpler predicate than the snark verifier as a whole. So now we've taken, we've gone from, you know, constructing an accumulation scheme for a complex predicate, which is the, um, it's not verified to construct an accumulation scheme for a potentially si simpler predicate, which is this phi, right? And we'll see how we can actually leverage this. This is exactly what happens. Um, so there's a question in the chat. Um, so the quantum secure property is basically, um, we don't do like anything, like in this reduction that's um, happening here. Oops, there we go. This so reduction is happening. Right. There are a class of RSA and uh, other structure-based accumulators. So if I understand that correctly, then it doesn't have QC resistance, right? Or do we have no properties for accumulators? Uh, so okay, two things. So I think as Nick said, like this has nothing to do with uh, set accumulators, right? So the yeah. accumulators are for set accumulation, right? They okay. check membership in a set. So that's like a separate concept. Um, like unfortunately, we try to like reason about different names, but sort of accumulation scheme was of the best, uh, most apt name that we come, could come up okay. with. That's like one thing. So there's like, there's no, uh, this has nothing to do with set accumulators, right? Okay. And as a second thing, um, uh, like this reduction only talks about like some abstract things, right? It says, if you give me an abstract snark, which has some, is predicate efficient with respect to some predicate phi, right? Yeah. And as long as I have an accumulation scheme for that predicate, then, and then I can construct an accumulation mm -hmm. scheme for the final snark. Yeah. Right. And if the snark is quantum secure, and sort of the accumulation scheme for this inner predicate is quantum secure, then the accumulation scheme for the snark no, is also no, 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 no. okay. Fine. Thanks. Um, yeah. Um, and the idea is that at this point we haven't instantiated any of these components, so like you know, it's sort of an abstract statement saying if if you give me quantum secure ingredients, I can get out of quantum secure. No, 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 no. Final point. That's all we're saying. Uh, as yet, we don't have any sort of interesting quantum secure accumulation schemes, um, just yeah. because of the, the things that, that uh, like the the nature of the construction so far, we've been mostly interested in in, uh, 
these like problem level commitments um and we don't really we don't have post quantum secure constructions of those is that yes. is that because um uh quantum secure alg algorithms um tend to have less structure and you need the structure in order to produce a, a polynomial commitment scheme or yeah, that, that's basically it. I mean, you can get like like lattice based primitives do have structure, but not as rich a structure or as like useful a structure as like uh, as you know bilinear groups and things like that. Is it right if I said lattice groups do have some structure that's so well structured that we can actually have some attacks versus you know bilinear groups that's the structure, but the structure is slightly different, gives us some uh, you know proofs of Randomness in that sense. Uh, Can I say I, it that way? No, I, actually, I would say that lattice, lattices have sort of less structure. So lattices have the sort of uh, usually linear homomorphisms, um, yeah. which uh, which also you know groups have. Um, yeah. But the lattice-based linear homomorphisms are sort of less flexible. Uh, you like they're only bounded. Uh, you know, you can only apply them boundedly many times. Uh, okay. There's no pairings. You know, sort of. Sort of uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And also in lattices, you, you do get like a very large dimension and then it's harder to actually identify the structure. Yeah, and you have to deal with like, things like noise growth and such. Uh, but in general, like sort of, yeah, as, as Nick was saying, so I did mention that everything here is abstract, but like unfortunate, and this sort of theorem holds, you know, this is a true statement, but we don't yet have ingredients which are, you know, namely the accumulation schemes which are quantum secure, so we can't sort of, plug those in and get like something that's quantum secure. But when those things come out in the future, I'm sure they will, then uh, if you plug it in here, then you will get out accumulation, quantum secure accumulation scheme for that snark. So, so on the, the third point, uh, um, is there a distinction between hiding and zero knowledge for an accumulation scheme or is there just one definition? Um, so sort of, uh, I guess zero knowledge maybe I'm not sure if that's like the most accurate term to describe the property. Basically, the idea is that you sort of can't distinguish like a, if I give you just an accumulator, um, mm -hmm. like you can't, uh, uh, what is the exact property I forget? Um, you can't sort of distinguish, yeah, even if you're, yeah, you can't distinguish like a sort of an honestly generated accumulator from like a sort of randomly sampled one, sort of is the uh, definition I that see. we have. Okay. So it's not exactly like zero knowledge in the sense of, um, so it, it is in some sense zero knowledge. It is sort of hide the graph built behind you in some sense, like of like what you accumulated in the past. But so, uh, so there's there's whether the commitment is hiding, and there's also whether the opening proofs are zero knowledge. Is that right? So okay, so that like that's when you sort of get into like the concrete instantiations with PC schemes, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, oh, but, like, but at this point, you're still on the, the more abstract uh, concept. Okay, got it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, so essentially, like, we, as we get into the PC scheme, you'll see that it, it does depend on the PC scheme, like what sort of properties required for the PC scheme. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll go into that a bit more. If, you, if I forget, just please remind me of that when I get there. Okay, uh, sorry, yeah. sorry. I, I'm sorry I wasn't able to join earlier. I had another um, clashing meeting. Oh, no worries. Carry on. Uh, yeah, if, you, if I can just uh, put in a six of the the definition of zero knowledge that we have is a simulation based definition as for, for accumulation schemes. So it is zero knowledge in, in that sense. Um, yeah. We actually didn't explore really uh, whether uh, an indistinguishability based definition would have worked. Um, I Maybe it would have, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, uh, but it is a like a simulation based definition, basically that you can come up with an accumulator that sort of looks the the same as uh, you can you can come up with an accumulator out of nothing that looks the same as an accumulator that you was honestly generated. Yep. I yeah, see. So, if, so if the accumulation scheme uh, relies on a um, a common reference string, then you're allowing the simulator to pick the common reference string. Is that right? Uh, yes, uh, yes, I think so. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so yeah, for concrete PCs, for, like, for the PC schemes that you'll see, like for the ones based on discrete logs, uh, yeah, so there, for example, you would have to do some, allow the accumulation scheme simply to sample the trapdoor, I think. 
but that, that's like yeah so the yeah we'll get into that uh, i guess later okay so the efficiency so as i said basically what we've done in this section is to go from the task of designing an accumulation scheme for a complex predicate namely a snark verifier to uh, designing an accumulation scheme for a potentially simpler predicate this phi thing okay so let's see what like what you know this phi can actually be and so where do you find these predicate efficient snarks okay and uh, okay so the starting point is like so in in the past few years people have introduced or i guess in the past year people have introduced uh, sort of this methodology for constructing snarks where you take in two components some information theoretic component like a polynomial iop or ahp along with a commitment a polynomial commitment or pc right and you sort of plug these into standard compilers like um, like what we have in Marlin or what um, Benedict and co worked on. And so if you get out a snark, uh, pre processing snark in this setting. Right? And uh, yeah, we know of various ways to instantiate both of these components. So, like for the top thing, you can look inside Sonic, Plonk, Marlin, and other works as well. And so sort of these give you these information theoretic paths. And for the polynomial commitment schemes, we also know of quite a few things by now, which is yeah, the original paper was the KCG10 paper. There's these uh, commitment schemes based on groups of unknown order. There's the one described in Halo and others as well in, in time sense. Right? And sort of this methodology has already been used to construct many popular snarks, such as um, you know, Sonic, Planck, Marlin, um, also in Halo and others as well. Right? So any questions about this methodology? This is not like something new that we introduced in this work. This is all basically prior work. Okay, so if not, okay, so the key thing inside this compiler to notice is that if you look at the verify for the snark that you that this compiler spits out, right, the it consists of one cheap portion, which corresponds in some sense to the verifier for this information theoretic component for the AHP, right, um, and one expensive component, which corresponds to uh, checking some stuff relating to the polynomial commitment scheme. So we'll see what these are in a second, but basically this is what the verifier looks like. There's some small component for the AHP and one expensive component for the PC scheme. Um, so there are some questions in chat. Let me try to look at them. No questions, Nick just had to bounce. Okay. Um, all right, so yeah. So I guess the thing to notice here is that if you look at this diagram here, it's very similar to the diagram that we had before, right? Where you can think of, so what, what this means is that this verifier is predicate efficient with respect to uh, this predicate phi, which is PC check, right? So VPE is now this VAHP and phi is PC check, right? So now if we can construct an accumulation scheme for this predicate PC check, right? Then perhaps we can, yeah, then we can apply our theorem from the previous section and construct an accumulation scheme for the uh, snark as a whole. Okay, so, right, so what we do, so yeah, basically this is sort of the diagram, the, thing that we try to do, right? So we can apply theorem two and then we can get out an accumulation scheme for the snark, right? So this basically means that now we have to try to construct accumulation schemes for polynomial commitments, okay? So just a quick recap of what a polynomial commitment scheme is. So in a polynomial commitment scheme, there's like two parties, a sender and a receiver. The sender has some polynomial in mind over some finite field, right? It uh, commits to this polynomial using this PC commit algorithm. Right, it sends this commitment C to the receiver, and what the receiver now says is like, "Give me the opening of, uh, prove to me that the polynomial that is committed inside C evaluates to something at uh, yes." Yeah, so it says, "Yeah, please provide me with the evaluation of this committed polynomial at some point Z of my choice." Right. So the receiver sends this to the to the sender, and the sender sort of plugs this point Z along with the original polynomial into this PC open algorithm which outputs the evaluation as well as a proof that uh, this evaluation is correct. Um, so what this means is that this proof uh, asserts that um, F of Z equals V, right? Okay, and so the receiver then plugs these, the commitment, the evaluation point and the evaluation and the proof into PC check and decides whether or not to accept. Right? So sort of this is the diagrammatic overview of a, a PC scheme. Any questions about this? Okay. So then we can go on. Um, yeah. 
So what we show in this paper is basically how to construct accumulation schemes for two popular polynomial commitments. Right? So the first one is uh, PCKZG, which is a polynomial commitment scheme based on the construction in uh, uh, the KZG 10 paper. Okay. And this is used, you know, uh, for example, is what underlies Marlin. It was on I, what, yeah, the original Planck paper uses PCKZG, Sonic as well, or variants of the scheme. Right? So it's a, it's a very popular scheme. In the, in the literature, right? And this is sort of a quick recap of the scheme. I, you won't need to know about it for what I'm gonna tell you next, but yeah, it's sort of simple enough to fit in sort of this diagram. Okay, so the properties of the scheme are that uh, checking uh, an evaluation proof takes two pairings, right? And the proof size is just two group elements, um, right? And what we show is that there, is, there exists an accumulation scheme in the random oracle model for this construction Right, which has the following properties. So the accumulation scheme, uh, the accumulation verifier requires no pairings, right? So, in, so you only do some uh, scalar multiplications. The accumulator size is still the same. It's you know, still two group elements, no matter how many proofs you're accumulating. And the decider now has to do one pairing at the end. Right? So this is nice because, um, yeah, so now at each, since so like if you're verifying n proofs, instead of being like n pairings, you can sort of, uh, accumulate them and then just do one um, shot. Uh, uh, yeah, you can just do scalar multiplication instead of pairings. And, and by the way, um, it's not just that pairings are inefficient, it's um, that they're really complicated um, to do well. So yeah. you, you're, you're likely to have security, uh, security problems if you try to do that in the snark. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. It's sort of re reducing the complexity inside you know, your snark uh, inside your recursive circuit, which is always good because it makes it easy to audit and um, yeah, just simpler to reason about and and cheaper in this case. Right. Okay, so as we'll see like in the app, in the final, like when you sort of plug in the entire things, we'll see like you get out a uh, IBC scheme, which has no uh, recursion inside the, no pairings inside the recursion, right? Okay, so that's one. Any questions about um, this about these results? So I won't go into the details here, but roughly the idea is that uh, instead of doing a pairing, you sort of um, take a random linear combination of the inputs to the pairings and sort of that's your accumulated thing, this randomly combined, um, yeah, the random linear combination of the inputs that becomes your accumulator at a very high level. Okay, so if there are no questions, I will go on. Okay, so what we show, that's, that's uh, for inside of the pairing setting. In the discrete log setting, what we show is that you know, if you have PCDL, which is a polynomial commitment scheme based on um, the so-called inner product argument, which has, you know, underlies many works, including bulletproofs and Halo, right? Um, so yeah, there's this PC scheme. And so this was described um, also in Halo. And the idea is that the security of PCDL re relies only on discrete logs and random oracles. So there's no pairings anywhere, right? So you can implement this with, you know, standard elliptic curves such as um, sec p two five six, um, as well as you know, uh, curve two five one nine. Any any standard elliptic curve, and you don't need pairings anywhere, right? And again, this is sort of a recap of the scheme. You won't need to know it, but yeah, the idea is that the PC open algorithm invokes um, the inner product argument for proving, and PC check invokes the verification uh, for the inner product argument. So this scheme has like the following efficiency properties. So PC check, like if you're committing to a polynomial of degree D, right? PC check takes uh, D uh, scalar multiplications, right? And proof size is O of log D, right? So the problem is that PC check is expensive. So it's linear in the size of the polynomial that is committed to, right? So uh, the cool thing is that Halo recently described a protocol for uh, accumulating PCDL. So the shows that you can take PCDL and construct an and not in these same words, but um, yeah, they show how to construct a accumulation scheme for PCTL. And what we show is that a variant of the, their protocol uh, is actually an accumulation scheme in the random oracle model for PCDL uh, with the following properties. Right? So the accumulation verifier now only requires log D scalar multiplications, not D. Right? The accumulator size is still the same, log D, as the proof. Right? And the decider now is the one doing the expensive heavy lifting of um, uh, the d scalar multiplications, right? 
And the, night, the sort of the takeaway is that uh, the verifying this accumulation is exponentially faster than sort of verifying uh, in an evaluation proof inside PC check. Right? And so sort of this is what we leverage, um, and this is what Halo leverages to construct sort of IVC end to end um, using PCDM. Okay, so any questions about this portion? I guess I, I, again, I won't go over the details of this construction, but um, yeah, the paper has more details, the Halo paper has more details. There's been a few talks about it, about um, you know how this is achieved. So yeah. Yeah, the, uh, there's a recent talk on the ZK Soul meetup um, about this. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, so there's yeah, lots of resources. Um, so if you're interested in like the details on this, uh, I would encourage you to go over that. Um, okay. So, so that sort of wraps up um, what we've gone through far. So what theorems one and two tell us is that you can um, construct IVC from a SNOC with an accumulation scheme, even if that SNOC is, uh, does not have sublinear verification, right? And theorem two tells us how to construct um, these accumulation schemes or these SNOCs with accumulation schemes from two ingredients, this predicate efficient SNOC where the verifier is cheap except for this expensive uh, portion phi, right? Along with an accumulation scheme for the expensive portion phi, right? Um, and this allows us to, like when we plug in these PCKCG and PCDL, uh, what this allows us to do is if you take your predicate efficient SNOC, which is efficient with respect to the PC check, right? You know, whatever goes into the, you know, it's like Sonic, Plonk, Malin, all of these, sort of they fall into this category. Um, so you take that SNOC and you take an accumulation scheme for PCKCG, right? And you apply theorem two along with the random oracle heuristic and theorem one, blah, 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 that you sort of instantiate the entire chain. What you get out is PCD and IVC from bilinear groups where you have trusted setup, which is unfortunate, but you have tiny proofs, just constant size, and there are no pairing, pairings in the recursive circuit, as Jera mentioned, right? So this is this, we didn't know how to do this before. All sort of prior constructions of recursive composition from um, pairing-based knocks uh, required doing pairings in the circuit. Okay, so this is a uh, yeah, cool new result. And on the other side, if we sort of do the same thing, but uh, plug in our accumulation scheme for PCDL, right? We get out um, PCD and IVC from standard groups with no pairings, right? And they have transparent setup, which is nice. And compared to like the prior work, which constructs, um, you know, transparent setup IVC, uh, the proof sizes are much smaller and proving time in general is better. Um, that that cost 20 is that fractal yeah that's fractal okay and that side has no trusted setup i guess yeah this side has no trust uh this, this is transparent setup so there's like no trusted setup anywhere so sort of the cost that you pay compared to this is that the proofs are larger so they're like um you know instead of being uh yeah kilobytes of uh, like less than a kilobyte or like maybe 500 bytes or so they are Proof as on this side, maybe like you know, two, three, four kilobytes or something like that. And verification time, like for the end, like sort of the final verification for the IVC is still linear, whereas here the verification time is um, is constant. It's O of one. Uh, yeah, it, it tends that turns out you can get the proof size down to about I think it's one point five k if you use a um, a more efficient um, polynomial layout like Plunk, for example. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah, I think yeah, that 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 sounds correct. Um, I guess the the yeah, it just sort of scales logarithmically still with the circuit size, right? So you would uh, yeah, it's it's exactly a logarithmic. Yeah, so as you get like larger circuits, you still have to suffer from like an increase in proof size. But yeah, you can yeah, use things as as you've mentioned in the past era. You can do like tree based composition, recursive composition, and so on and so forth, um, which can help you keep the proof size under control. Um, yeah, sort of, yeah. So both of these things we didn't know how to do before. So, you know, recursion with pairing based stuff without pairings in the circuit. And I guess we knew how to do PCD IVC from, you know, with transparent circuit, but we didn't know how to do it like with standard elliptic curve groups sufficiently um, and with sort of these small proofs that um, this side of the construction gets you. Okay. Um, right. So, okay. So I guess sort of that summarizes um, the paper uh, and sort of, the, sort of all of the results in the paper. And uh, so there's like lots of open questions right now. So first of all is how do you construct more accumulation schemes for different kinds of polynomial commitments with you know, different assumptions and different kinds of properties? Um, can you improve on, um, you know, 
yeah, for example, in the discrete log setting, can you construct accumulation schemes that don't have this sort of logarithmic overhead or don't require, yeah, the, uh, this logarithmic overhead inside the circuit, for example, or can you, as we discussed earlier, can you construct accum polynomial commitments and accumulation schemes from lattices? Can you accumulate, yeah, can you, can, another question is, can you even construct accumulation schemes that don't rely on the random oracle in the middle? Um, and so maybe that helps one part of uh, reducing the reliance on this random oracle heuristic and so on. Yeah, there's like lots of interesting questions there. Yeah, a, uh, a nice particular question is, can you construct an accumulation scheme from Dory, which is a, a very recent um, transparent uh, polynomial? Yes, I think, I think you can just because, uh, they, I mean, they already mentioned in the paper, they had this sort of accumulation, this aggregate checking, like verification, right? So yeah. that it, it's, it seems as though you should be able to do that. Yeah, uh, but like the sort of benefits there are somewhat less clear because in the end you're still like doing logarithmic work, but it's maybe slightly less logarithmic work. I mean, you might not have to do like the, some GT. Yeah, it, it would be in the constants that the um, that yeah you get that improvement. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think generally, like these inner product arguments, they all have this nice, the similar structure to what PCDL has, where in the end you're essentially checking a, a polynomial commitment or like evaluating a polynomial, and so you can apply the same techniques there as well. Um, okay, so sorry, that summarizes the thing. Any questions on you know any of these past three slides about PCKZG, PCDL, and this sort of summary here? Let me check the chat. I think it, it's good. Okay. Uh, sort of, yeah, the key takeaway is that sort of what we do in this paper is we, uh, like, so Halo had this idea that you can use some uh, nested amortization um, to construct IVC and sort of we sort of take that and I guess formalize it or extract it into a cryptographic primitive and prove properties about it. And uh, we show how to construct it for different sort of PC schemes and, um, yeah, this allows us to obtain new constructions of PCD and IVC that we didn't know how to do before. Okay. Uh, to instantiate construction on the left, uh, is half pairing cycle enough? So we don't need to use some MT curves for that. Right, so what you, so, okay. So if you just wanted to use just this left-hand side, then you would still need to use MNT curves. But the nice thing is that you can sort of, because you have efficient instantiations of the right-hand side, what you can do is you can mix and match. You can have, one side use um, this PCKCG based uh, accumulation, and you, have, you can have the other cycle, other curve and cycle, be non pairing friendly and rely on PCDL based accumulation. And um, I believe this is like what Coda was initially going to do. I think since then they've switched to just doing PCDL based uh, recursion. But yeah, so you can definitely uh, sort of mix and match these, these two sides of the. Uh, these two halves and uh, if you had like a half pairing so i guess for the other people in the chat a half pairing okay so existing pairing based recursion required elliptic curves which have um sort of this cyclical nature where the base field of one curve is the scalar field of the other curve and vice versa right and the only way we knew how to construct these special curves is via sort of this family of curves called mnt curves and these are like unlike you know things you might have heard of, like the BLS 12, 381, 377, all of these curves, they're quite inefficient um, when you have to achieve 128 bit security. So basically all pairing based recursion that we knew how, how to do so far was quite inefficient because of this reliance on these very heavy curves. Um, but what we do know how to do is construct um, elliptic curve cycles where only one curve in the, pair, in, the, in the cycle has to be pairing friendly. So this can be something like, you know, BN, like a Barretta narrow curve. Right? And only so only that one curve has to be pairing friendly and the other curve can be non-pairing friendly. And we know how to find such cycles very easily. Um, so what this allows you to do is now you can on the pairing friendly side, you can use PCKZG and on the non-pairing friendly side, you would use PCDL. And you can sort of mix and match these to get much more efficient recursion than you would with the MNT world. Yeah, and you don't have to do pairings in the circuit on either side. Yeah. So yeah, so yeah, on the on the pairing side, you inherit inherit the benefits of this. On the other side, you inherit the benefits of this. And yeah, actually, I, the I think the I think the um, the 
downside is that you you still have to do the linear work for the decider um because right but what you can do with that side. Uh, yeah you can set up so that the pcdl side is only tasked with doing um right exactly with, uh, sort of checking the accumulation for the for pckcg and you do all your heavy work on pckcg so this means that pcdl thing is always like a fixed circuit so it's always like I mean, in some sense, it's constant work, uh, but yeah, because the circuit is like, you know, only the recursive circuit, then it's always the same amount of work on PCDL. Right, and even the logarithmic work, work you, you only do on the, so it takes log work to do the PCDL accumulation, but you're doing that on the, uh, on, on the uh, pairing side, on the pairing side, right? Right, so I mean, so what so I mean- So you only do the constant work for, for, for doing the accumulation for PCKGT, and you'd be doing that inside your, uh, PCL, right, so, inside, so it'd be much simpler. Yeah. Yeah. Inside the recursive circuits on each side. Um, so, okay. So, on the recursive circuit on this left half, you're checking the accumulation scheme verifier for PCDL. So, you're doing log work on this side. And on the PCDL side, the recursive circuit is checking the accumulation for uh, PCKCG, which is O of one work. Right. And basically, what this means is that when in the end you have to run the decider for sort of this side, right, it'll be for like a constant size circuit. And that's what I meant. Um, so it'll be like linear in that si in the in the size of that circuit, but that circuit, the size of that circuit is always um, some fixed constant. So it won't grow with like the you know the computation that you actually perform um, at each step of the IVC or PCT. Um, there was one question in the chat. Unless Alan, did you want to ask something first? Sorry, I have a question as well about the random sure. oracle heuristic. Uh, that's about uh, your verifier requires the evaluation of a hash function, but you're implementing this as part of the circuit, correct? Yeah, so the problem is that um, inside the recursive circuit, you have to either, uh, uh, you have to like put either the snark verifier or the accumulation verifier, right? And both of these things in all of the constructions we know so far uh, require random oracles. So when you express it as a circuit, you have to instantiate the random oracle heuristically with some hash function. And um, yeah, so that's where sort of this random oracle heuristic comes in. So I guess it's a question in the chat. Let me take a look. How do I go back there? Chat, chat. I can actually just say it um, again from Srikar. It was, what would you say is a major open problem emerging from this work or any good directions? I think, uh, yeah, I think we went over quite a few of these, like one of these, for example, is constructing more accumulation schemes for different polynomial commitments for different properties. The other thing is, so this paper does not do like a concrete instantiation of, you know, like implementation of all of, the, of any of these things. Um, so Halo does it for this left hand or the right hand side. Uh, but uh, yeah, it would be interesting to see. And I think like Coda, they started doing stuff for uh, like doing this mix and match approach where you do PCKCG, PCDL. So yeah, seeing the concrete costs of doing the mix and match approach, um, and you know what that even makes sense because you have to use like a larger curve size, whether that even makes sense to do this mix and match approach um, compared to the PCD as approach. I think the motivation for um, Coda, which is now called Mina, um, to drop that approach is that they wanted to go to a completely um, transparent setup. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's one. That was the yeah. main thing, uh, and. I think they also considered the the concrete costs, uh, and it it turned out that the so for their use case, the um, the concrete costs of Halo were not um, were completely fine. Yeah. Right. So yeah. So yeah. There's like a yeah some trade-offs there um, to be mentioned, like to be figured out on like you know whether it makes sense to mix and match. Um, other interesting things that I mentioned was you know, trying to get rid of the random oracle, at least in parts of these ingredients. Like, I mean, at least like all of the snarks we know of, we still need it on like the snark side even, but at least can, can you get rid of it on the accumulation scheme side um, or maybe like an impossibility result there. Um, yeah, maybe constructing accumulation schemes for different uh, primitives, like for signatures, like what would that look like or for other things? We have like a verification algorithm. Um, well, does that lead to anything interesting in terms of applications? There's, I think, yeah, there's quite a few sort of open there's questions. The, there's another thing that um, I was thinking about, um, which is 
can you construct uh, a shark um, from using this mix and match approach? So if you just apply it in the straightforward way, then you're relying on the trusted setup at each step in the, um, the recursion. Um, can you sort of move that reliance um, on the trusted setup to just the um, decider step so that um, you can take any of the um, intermediate proofs and if the, if the trusted setup were broken, you could then um, sort of regenerate the shark from any intermediate proof. Um, does yeah, that that's, sense? Yeah. Yeah, that's all, yeah, so yes, I guess for the other people in the chat, um, uh, shark is a, a kind of snark where you have sort of two verification modes. One is uh, sort of uh, yeah, optimistic verification where like you verify using the trusted setup portion and there's like a inefficient uh, or like slower verification mode where you don't rely on the trusted setup and you check everything very carefully. Um, uh, and this basically allows you to you know check if the trusted setup was ever compromised because you always have sort of a fallback to the uh, slower verification mode, which does not use the trusted setup. And so Dara was asking whether, I think, so Dara, I'm not sure about, and then quite understand like what exactly you meant. Like, do you meant like, do you mean like recursion, and maybe like IVC, which has this sort of hybrid verification property? Is that what you meant? Uh, yes. Yeah. So we yeah, are basically where the, where the final IVC verifier also has this sort of two, two mode verification where one is optimistic and one is, uh, like, yes, uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, uh, more paranoid. And yeah, I think I think that's also interesting. I think even just the question of just constructing sharks using this concept, um, I feel like there might be something uh, even, even without you know, talking about the recursion idea. Just constructing sharks um, mm. yep. using yeah, just the, this idea could be interesting. Um, cool. Yeah. Well, I think uh, on that. Oh, well, unless, is there I, one, more one more question? Okay, one, one more. Question. <laughs> um, so the, the other thing I'm interested in is um, this theoretical question of the, uh, the extractor blow up. So um, mm -hmm. if you just um, use um, IBC in a train, um, then the, um, the size of the extractor increases at each step. So one way of getting around that is just to apply it to a fixed depth tree. Um, but um, so say you're doing a blockchain protocol, the, the natural way of using recursion is just to, um, to apply it to the previous block. Um, mm -hmm. So is there a way of getting around this theoretical problem and getting a satisfying security proof for, for IBC for arbitrary length trains? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's uh, certainly very, it, it, that's certainly a very interesting question. It also applies not only to this sort of IBC that we construct in this paper, but also sort of the previous way to do IBC, which is um, using yes. uh, sort of just standard snacks without accumulation schemes anywhere. Um, but maybe maybe along using accumulation schemes might allow you to sort of make uh, yeah a breakthrough and try to because you're not like really running the snark verifier each, each, each step, maybe that allows you to do something better. Um, you're still running the snark extractor each step, unfortunately, in the, at least in the current proof. Yeah, but maybe there's some way to do it. But there's no. no obvious way of doing it. But, um, Doesn't this, this random oracle you're using to combine these things, isn't that something you need to rewind in the extractor? Right, so if you, if you go back, um, way back to here, so, Going back, I'll go back. Okay, uh, so all the way back. Okay, so summary of results, right? So, uh, yeah, okay, so maybe this, this slide, the previous slide is clearer. So, basically, inside this theorem, which allows us to go from snacks with accumulation schemes to snacks with uh, to, to PCD, right? This thing is can is also like, it works in standard model also. It's just that we don't know how to construct, you know, things which are snarks with accumulation schemes without random oracles. But like, if you just assume that you have a snark with an accumulation scheme, which for example, you can like, 
sort of sort of construct one for growth 16 also. Um, so in that sense, you would have a snack with an accumulation scheme uh, in, the, in the standard model. Uh, like you could plug that into this theorem one and get out a snack with an accumulation scheme in with, uh, you can get like IVC from these things in the standard model, but sort of this this sort of theorem one is in the standard model. It doesn't uh, it requires sort of your snark verifier circuit to be not like an oracle circuit or something. Um, so by by the time you get to like the recursion, like you've already instantiated your hash function in some sense. Uh, and sort of, yeah, you are, yeah, so then like your assumption of rewinding a random oracle, like programming a random oracle, it doesn't quite make sense because you've already instantiated it. So sort of that's the irritating step right now. Um, yeah. That makes sense. Cool. All right, All right. I, think, I think if it's okay, we're gonna, we're gonna wrap it up here. But thank you so much, Pratush. Thank you to Nick, who bounced off a little bit earlier. But thanks for, for doing this presentation. And thanks to everyone who, uh, who joined. Yeah, thank you, Anna. And thank you, everyone else as well. Thanks, Anna. Cool. Thanks, Pratush. Till next time. Everyone else. Thanks.